problem. That seems to work pretty well. And frankly, the results have been pretty good up to date. Well, when you start talking about these larger cuff tears, can the ship be built in a bottle? If you have cuff atrophy that gets to here, no problem. You can get to it from, from the edge of the bottle. If the cuff starts to pull back to here, well, now you're going to have to try and pull it out, but it's going to be under a little bit of tension as you do. Cuff tears like this, now we're looking at it reaching the cuff on the other side of the humeral head. So we're having to reach all the way across the shoulder joint to the area where the, the glenoid socket is to access this cuff. And that's just a hard thing to do. And it would be like trying to build a ship in a bottle working on the, the, the sail all the way in the back of the cuff working from this side of the bottle. And it's a difficult thing to do. This gives you a sense on this picture to the upper right about how tough it would be. I mean, this is the view I have from looking inside the bottle of the ship that's sitting right in front of us here when you're working from the edge. So imagine trying to work on the other side of the ship. Well, the failures in large cuff tears started to occur because people were lassoing the end of this cuff. They were trying to bring it to bone under tension and then hope that it would hold there. And unfortunately, many of these cuff tears in the larger cuffs just fail. As soon as the person puts their arm down, as soon as they try and work the cuff, the, the tissue, which has now been repaired under some tension, pulls away from the cuff and doesn't, doesn't work. And this is why, for these larger cuff tears, they really sort of became accepted as being irreparable. People started to say, I've got a tear that can't be fixed because it's just going to require too much or it can't be mobilized or can't be brought out to where it needs to insert at the end of the humerus. So the treatment of large cuff tears up until the mid-1990s, really the surgeon had three options. You could either give up and tell the person that, I'm sorry, it's a bad problem, your rotator cuff is irreparable. You could build the cuff on the outside, as you will, by taking down the muscles around the shoulder, building the cuff or trying to reconstruct it uh, with an, a large open surgery and then trying to put the muscles back. But the problem is that the complications of taking down the deltoid muscles and the larger muscles around the shoulder are devastating. So a lot of surgeons really try not to do these large open surgeries. The last thing you could do is repair the cuff under tension or pull that cuff edge out as far as you can get it and hope that it can heal there. Well, with the arthroscope and with arthroscopy and some of the new portals and things like that, there was a change in paradigm. And to give you a sense of it, I made a little video here of this ship that uh, we made in the bottle. And we're sort of taking a look at what you can do with a scope that's different. So if we come to the end of the bottle, we pull off the cork and we take a peek. This is what you can do from outside the shoulder versus with the scope, you can pretty much get on deck. And if you need be, you could tighten up a line here or there, kind of take a look at the aft side, check and see my workmanship. We'll come underneath here. There's a couple barnacles there we should get rid of. You know, you can see an awful lot with the scope. And what's interesting is when you have global access uh, to the shoulder or to any joint with the scope by being able to put multiple portals in or multiple regions where you're entering the joint, suddenly there's a lot of things, there's a whole new world that opens up in terms of what you can take care of. Well, the same thing holds true in the shoulder, and we'll take a little tour of the shoulder joint here. I'm going to show you a shoulder joint that actually has one of these partial undersurface, like the early beginnings of a cuff tear, and we'll point it out as we get there. We're going to start out on this shoulder, sort of looking at the socket. This is the top of the socket. We can't see the whole thing at one time. This is a, a, a tendon called the biceps tendon. It's one of the, the, the parts of the arm muscle that, that flexes your elbow. And one side of that biceps comes up and through the joint and actually attaches at the top of the socket. You can see here we're sort of pulling this biceps into the joint to check and see how it looks. Right here, this uh, uh, particular uh, uh, tendon that you see coming across the front of the joint is actually the subscap tendon. That is the the rotator cuff muscle on the front of the joint. So we're looking from the back of the joint in and through to the front of the joint and we're looking at the integrity of this tendon. And frankly, this is the way they look. This one looks pretty good. This is the humeral head over here. We can take a look at the ligaments of the shoulder joint that stabilize the shoulder and keep it from coming out. And what we're, we're taking a peek here, this is a metal probe that we use just to kind of take a peek around. These are the ligaments of the shoulder joint here. They surround the, the head of the humerus like a hammock to hold it up in the joint. Um, they come off of this tissue called the labrum, which is sort of like a gasket, if you will, around the front of the shoulder joint. If you've got a little camera inside somebody's shoulder, basically, from the front, it's, the camera is coming in from the rear of the shoulder. The rear. Okay. And 
we're actually looking from the back across the shoulder joint to the front of the shoulder. So you're actually looking at the front of the shoulder. If I were to tap the person that I'm scoping here, about here on the front of their shoulder, we could actually see some deep, if I did it deep enough, you could okay. see finger indentations on the front wall right here where we're operating. So the, the, your, your probe thing and the camera are both coming The probe through is coming the through the front. The probe is coming through the front. Yes, there are two portals here now. We've okay. got one portal in the back, which you can't see because we're looking through it. All right. We've got a second portal that's in the front, and that's where the probe is coming through. Okay. Sure. And thanks for asking the question because I, I, I take this for granted that this is fairly obvious, but it's not, I know. So again, this is the front of the shoulder joint out here. We're coming from the back of the shoulder joint, and we're looking at this socket. This is the back of the socket back here. This kind of flimsy tissue is normal. That's the back part of that labral tissue, if you will. This is the rotator cuff coming across the top here. We're sort of getting a peak. This is from all the way below. We're entering the area down here that's right at the armpit. We're looking from the back to the front, looking down. So essentially, this area right here, if we were to go through, you'd come right out at the armpit. So we're looking down from the inside of the shoulder joint. Continuing on, there's a little blood there. We'll kind of wash out a little squirt. The, the scope is actually looking through a fluid medium. So we're pumping arthroscopy fluid, which is like saline, into the joint. And we're also draining that fluid from the joint at the same time so the joint stays clear. Here's the cuff tear that I was telling you about. We're now looking at the edge of the humerus. So here's, this is the top of the humerus here. This is the edge where the cuff should be inserting. And just like in the diagram here where you see these, these frayed tissues starting to fall, this is exactly what you're seeing here. This is attrition. These tissues are, are weak. They're tired. They've been trying to pull. And as the cuff pulls, it's starting to rip like a, a worn rope or a boated anchor. And this is the top inside of the shoulder joint, inside the cuff where this is occurring. And these are tears occurring at the inside of the shoulder joint cuff. We just kind of use the probe to, to check things out here, take a peek, see what's going on. So again, this is that top cuff muscle of the supraspinatus. The, the cuff muscles at the back of the shoulder are actually behind us. We've come through them to get into the shoulder. And this is where they're inserting at the back of the head. And, and that's what we get. Well, rotator cuff tears from the inside of the shoulder joint take on a whole new appearance. This first image is just a still from the video that you just looked at. And again, here's the head. Here are these attritional fibers that are giving way. This is what it looks like inside the shoulder joint. If we move the scope above the rotator cuff, so we're under the roof of the shoulder, but we're, we've come out of the shoulder and gone above the cuff, this is what we see there. This is the bony roof over the shoulder. I had placed a suture into the inside of the joint here so I could see where that cuff tear was. And then we can look on the outside of the cuff and see where that, that cuff tear was from the outside. And this is a relatively normal appearance. There's, the suture is coming right out of the cuff uh, from the inside. The second image is when you see the cuff tears that are starting to progress and they're starting to pull back a little more. We're looking at the same image right here, the top of the head. Now the cuff is no longer sort of inserting here. You can see the fibers where the cuff used to be, but it's sort of pulled off. And you can see this little area where the entire cuff has kind of pulled off of the top of the uh, head and has basically started to recede, just like you see in the picture here. Again, if we step outside the cuff and look from the top, what we see is this little hole. Here's the cuff. I've got a suture through the cuff. I'm actually looking into the joint down here, and this is the bony roof over the cuff here. When they get to be massive and the cuff tear has pulled back all the way to the level of the glenoid, well, now looking at the top of the head, and again, this is the same view here, the same view here, this is another patient, the same view here, the entire cuff is absent from its insertion here. It's just nowhere to be found. Where do you find it? Well, if you look to the inside into the joint, here's the cuff. It's pulled back all the way to where the socket is. The head has no coverage anymore. The cuff is completely pulled back away from where the head is. From, from where it needs to be attached at the end of the head. Clearly, this cuff, questionably this cuff, and probably not this cuff, are causing significant problems with the shoulder. Well, the real advantage of arthroscopy and the real revolution in all this uh, came from this shift in paradigms about how to actually fix these cuff tears. The initial discouraging results with trying to fix the cuff tears using the scope and the, the, the discouraging results of doing these procedures open was that we were trying to pull the cuff out from here and get this point all the way out to the bone here, and it was under too much tension and it failed. Well, 
people started thinking, what if you just sewed this thing up like a tent flap or sewed it up like a zipper and started bringing one end of the cuff here to this end here and gradually brought it together and covered the cuff well, and, and covered the head? Well, that's exactly what we can do. It's hard to do if you're working from way out here, like through a bottleneck, but it's very easy to do if you're standing inside the shoulder, uh, as it were, with the arthroscope. And that's exactly this this technique, which is called margin convergence, that has allowed us to fix some of the really huge cuff tears uh, that occur in the shoulder. This is uh, some pictures of this actually in process. So what we're seeing here, again, just to give you some bearings, we're looking sort of at the aft of the ship. This is the socket part of the ball and socket joint of, of the, humor, of the uh, shoulder. This is a little glimpse of the head right here. There's that biceps tendon that comes across. The rotator cuff has pulled to where it's all the way at the socket. It should be in our way. We should not be able to look from the bony roof of the, uh, that's over the shoulder into the joint. There should be a rotator cuff in our way, but it's not in our way. It's pulled back. So what we do is we use special instruments to pass sutures from one side of this to the other side of it and start to close it down piece by piece, stitch by stitch, until now, from the exact same view here as here, we've now closed the cuff between the top of the head and the, the joint itself. So ironically, it always sort of strikes me as being interesting when people come and say, you know, I've been told that my problem is too bad to be treated with the scope, or I've been, I've been told uh, you know, that this, this is something that needs to be done open because it's a big problem. But I actually think that the real argument is that the biggest problems are the ones that we should be using the scope at least to address partially, okay? Well, what's the rub? I mean, what's the problem with shoulder arthroscopy and why isn't it the, the main standard? Well, the problem, and there are problems, have to do with the way that we actually fix this cuff down once we get it approximated and in the right spot. And the sort of classic way to do this is to actually make tunnels through the bone and suture the cuff directly to the bone using these bone tunnels. But that is a very difficult thing to do through the arthroscope. So what we've devised are these series of devices, and these are all essentially the same device made by different manufacturers called a suture anchor. And I'm not carrying the analogy too far. That's actually what these are called, suture anchors. But what these suture anchors do is you create a hole in the cuff and actually screw the anchor down into the bone, just like a molly bolt in drywall. And all that sticks out is the suture that's left at the top of the anchor. And then that suture is what's used to tie down the cuff. Well, the problem with this is that, one, it's very difficult to do. Um, and not getting the cuff together is, is tough, but also actually getting the sutures passed and sort of keeping all these threads and sutures and all the rigging, if you will, straight while you're trying to get it down can be a problem for surgeons. The second thing is that once you get it down, you tie these knots that are frequently fairly prominent on top of the cuff, and these can be somewhat uh, symptomatic. People can complain a little bit, at least for a short while, about the knots. Now, some substances dissolve and some don't. And uh, there's a whole list of things that would be very technical and hard to get into, but. The bottom line is it's still not as perfect as having bone tunnels when you suture it down. The, the, the anchors, as I said, are not as strong as uh, bone tunnels. The bulky knots can cause symptoms. Some of the suture anchors are made of absorbable plastics that lose their strength over time, so it's kind of a race between the cuff healing down on its own and the anchor dissolving. And really, the only function of these anchors and the idea behind the surgery is that you've got to hold down the cuff while your own healing occurs. These anchors are not they shouldn't be providing any stability after about 12 to 16 weeks. What happens is they just hold the cuff in place, your body heals the cuff, then your body's doing all the work, the anchor's just a decoration, and that's what's nice about the absorbable anchors is they kind of go away. The bottom line, though, is that you can't rush Mother Nature. And so one of the, the sort of false things about arthroscopy is it doesn't speed your healing. Patients may feel better, but that's actually a bad thing, I think, in some ways. If you have a big open surgery and you make a lot of big incisions, people hurt, and therefore they don't move the cuff when you're trying to get it to heal down. If you do an arthroscopic procedure, it's small incisions. People feel better a lot quicker than they're actually healed. So patients probably need to be protected even longer after they have an arthroscopic procedure. 
Also, everyone talks about, well, I had arthroscopy. If I'm going to have arthroscopy, I'm going to have tiny little incisions. It's true. Each incision is quite small. But if you think about it, I've told you just to look at the shoulder and examine it, about two incisions, one in the back and one in the front. Now, if we're talking about fixing the cuff, you might end up with a couple more on the side, one on the